Um, The reading today is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 18. And this is Jesus speaking. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you. When you fast, do not look sombre as the hypocrites do for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Well, great. If you're visiting us here this uh, Sunday, it's great to have you with us. Um, Is there parents of students around? Good morning to you. Anybody else visiting this morning? It's good to have you with us. Thank you for coming and joining us. We're in week seven of a series which is called Maturity in Christ. And part of this, just give a very quick recap for those that are just joining with us. We were looking at how we become mature in Christ. How do we grow? What are those hallmarks? What are those things that help us to have that steadfast kind of standing firm stuff that the Bible talks about? When the storms come and things come and, you know, we've had an interesting week this week, things get thrown of you. How resilient are we? And one of those things we spoke about was our spiritual toolkits. If you haven't got a spiritual toolkit, you can speak to your son or daughter, whoever you came with today, and say, what's this spiritual toolkit all about? Uh, What's in yours? And then maybe you can share some ideas as what should be in there. But I've found with all things, you know, when the name of Jesus is lifted high, it demands a response, doesn't it? Do you ever find that? If you mention the name of Jesus... How many people here, I think the phrase that seems to be nowadays go, if you say I'm a Christian or you wear something and say, well, what would Jesus do, bands, whatever, they go, oh, you're religious. Is that the first thing that's said to you? Are you religious? Jesus always seems to divide a room. And actually the takeaway message, I don't know if you remember last week, but the thing that I challenged us with was what is good versus what is our purpose? And there's another side, obviously, to that coin, in a sense, uh, which is the bad stuff. Those things that are revealed in the news or or, or gossip or things that go around. But I love those verses from Ephesians. I'll try and put some of these things up on the screen for us this morning. Ephesians 5.13. This verse keeps coming round and round and round again. I hope some of the men from the weekend away will remember this as well. It's such a great verse. It says, but everything exists exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated by the light becomes light this is why it said wake up O sleeper rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you be very careful then how you live not as unwise but as wise making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil Therefore, do not be foolish, 
but understand what the Lord's will is. And actually following the closing of the service last week, there were a whole bunch of folk that came forwards. Bless you for coming forwards. And if you, if you were in that place and you didn't necessarily hear or receive something from God last week, one of the things that I think that is very clear that God says to us, which we don't like to hear very often, is that little four-letter word, which is wait. And we have to wait on God. Who likes waiting? Uh. We need to seek what we were looking at last week is what is God's purpose in our lives and I don't want to leave anybody hanging on if you were here last week and you think well I made a real bold step to come forward I didn't feel I got anything do catch somebody today I don't want to do something at church it's not about saying hey wasn't it great to get a response at the front today I want it to be wasn't it great that, that you put yourself before God he showed up and he gave you what the next steps are it might be that you only know what the next step is I certainly know in my life, if I saw the next three or four, I'd have gone, not taking the first one. Yeah? So God is good. The theme this week, um, I mentioned this last week because I switched the weeks around. This week is about prayer and fasting. But as normal, I like to start with a question. So here's a question for us this morning. You're asking, so are my actions, thoughts and deeds, etc., driven by wickedness or righteousness and hopefully you've all got an instant reaction oh of course it's 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 righteousness Darren Um, we would reject wickedness of course maybe maybe there's a little bit of side that's wicked I don't know but we would aim towards righteousness would you say it's a hundred percent righteousness though you know I'm, I'm aiming for that but how far do I actually get is it somewhere in the middle I'm getting better at this God stuff. Is that what we would say as an honest answer? To unpick this further, if we look at biblical world views of wickedness and righteousness, you can boil it right down to its basics. I like to boil things right down sometimes. And wickedness actually reduces itself down, for, for the purposes today, I think, to selfishness. When we are being wicked, we're normally being very selfish. It's about looking after me or my stuff, the things that I've, I've bought, I've earned, hands off. Don't change it. That can even happen in church sometimes. Whereas righteousness, of course, is about denying self. It's about going beyond self, isn't it? Jesus is our perfect example of that righteous life. Giving up even heaven itself I love Philippians if you ever need a holy hug I think Philippians is a really good letter to dive into isn't it Philippians 2 5 uh, 5 to sorry Philippians 2 verses 5 through to 11 tells us how we should act and I think I've got this on the screen for you again this morning but it says this in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus easier read than done who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And there's our therefore. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. I'm sure you know this bit well. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Come on. Amen to that. What a beautiful bit of scripture. Now maybe... All these things that we've read or I've read so far this morning leaves you saying, yes, but how do we know what God's call is? How do we know? How do we know what God is saying? How do I know what my purpose is? I don't know if anybody, you don't have to put your hands up or anything, but I wonder after last week how many people are saying, well, okay, what is my purpose? Some of you shouldn't be smiling at that. I think you know jolly well what your purposes are, some of you. (laughs) 
But it's tough, isn't it? What is my purpose? And there's a number of possible answers to this. A very common one might be that we have already heard from God. You know where this is going. I have heard from God, but am I going to be obedient to it? There's that stirring within us. Actually, God, I know how you've made me. Do you remember what I was saying last week about the bank manager? Uh, You might have gone off and done something. You've been this particular person in your life, but you know that's not how God wired us to be. But we're lacking in confidence, or as I read out during our sung worship time, obedience to step into those things that God is calling us to. Or God is simply waiting for us to connect to him. It can be that thing. We're just not connected to God. To do that stopping bit, maybe just to do that waiting bit. And that's my encouragement to you because if you came forward last week or you stayed in your chair and you said, okay, God, what is it? And you went, it was kind of like I didn't hear anything or feel anything or get anything from God. There might be that time we need to connect to him that little bit more. So the question he's going to say is, well, then how do we connect to God? And that's what we're going to kind of look at this morning. One of those ways, of course, is through prayer. Now, let's just be really clear. I've got like, well, I'm maybe a third of the way through the message already, and I've only just landed at prayer. Prayer is a huge, huge, huge subject. And just for fun, we're going to look at prayer and fasting this morning. So it's going to be a real whistle-stop tour as we kind of go through this. But I'm going to try and break it down into two very practical areas, but it is a skimming overview. So if you think I didn't go particularly deep with that this morning, Just hold on to where we end up with this. So there's two areas that I think is our focus and our practice. And then I'm going to right at the end, we'll just dip into fasting and power. But let's look at focus and practice first. Well, first of all, the first part of that is actually our focus. And our primary focus when we pray is what? Go on, Nigel. I'll be pointing upwards. That wasn't an answer. Our primary focus, I believe, is to hear from God. Are we agreed? Our primary focus is to hear from God. Now, we've obviously got the, uh, we live in a world of vending machines. I put this word down. Do we live in a world of vending machines? How many, do you have vending machines at university now? I know they have it at school. A world of vending. Put something in and you should get something out to the right sort of value as to what you put in. What about drive throughs drive throughs are pretty cool now, aren't they? You know, whip into the drive through Better than that if you live in Falmouth, Amazon, Amazon Prime, get it now. Where we used to live in Coventry, we were part of the, the Amazon Prime. We were part of the Amazon Now, which means if you ordered it, you could have it delivered to your door within an hour. Come on. They don't come to Falmouth in an hour, do they? It's a bit further than that. But we live in that culture, don't we, of, of I can have it now. So when I pray to God, bear in mind he is God because he's far more awesome than Amazon, I should be able to have it now, shouldn't I? I mean, that's kind of the logical thinking. But sadly, I think that's how the father of lies whispers into our ears. And he says things like, well, surely there can't be a God because he didn't answer your prayer, did he? You said God jump. He didn't jump. Therefore, there can be no God's. I know there's folk who've been in church and said before, you know, I've I've had friends maybe seeking and said, well, I've asked God for this and I've asked God for that. And he didn't answer me and he didn't give it to me. Therefore, there is no God. But you see, prayer is not about God being that holy vending machine. That if I put the right amount in, I get the right amount of God's stuff out. I don't know what that sounds like, but that sounds a bit like to me, if you were to boil it down to selfishness, you know, I want to get what I put in. I put something in, I want something back. Even sometimes if we're asking for others, we kind of do it in the veil of righteousness. Well, actually, I'm asking for somebody else. So God, if I'm stepping out and doing this, surely you must answer me. But rather, I'm saying this morning, prayer should be about seeking God and his will for our situations. I would say nine times out of ten, God knows the answer, sorry, you know the answer, and the answer is that God has chosen you. 
I always I had a lovely uh, series that we did. I was going to create some T-shirts called "I Am the If," um, which is gram grammatically incorrect. But actually, when it comes to prayer, you know, if you go to God and say, "God, if only this would happen, if only that would happen," and you keep saying, "If, if, 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 if," the answer is, "I am the if." God has chosen me because He's revealed that to me, and the chances are, I am the one that actually needs to do that if. But it involves making sacrifices sometimes, doesn't it? You don't want to necessarily do those things. We actually want God, and sometimes we say, well, if God would wave that supernatural um, magic wand and stuff, I don't have to do it, and God gets all the glory because he's amazing. And that's sometimes how we operate, isn't it? We want that quick fix, drive-through, Amazon delivery, prime answer with no effort on our part. Guess what? It's not in the Bible. You will not find that there. So why pray then if it's not about telling God what I want or what I need? And I believe the answer is for you and I to find out what is God's agenda. What is God's doing? We see it, don't we, throughout the Old and New Testament that people prayed because they needed God's direction. But more often than not, rather than waiting to hear what God says we see many people go off and do things their own way I don't know if any examples jump to mind what about Abraham you know could he not have just waited I know he was a bit old but God had said and he didn't wait did he how many of us are guilty of things like that today if only I had waited then the chances are the majority of us have been in that place, haven't we? I was looking back at revivals over this last week. And if you actually look back at most revivals, they started with a few folk that were praying. There was that tiny little spark, that first flame. I like the matches, the box of matches. You know what's happening up there, don't you? You like the first one. Who did it as kids? <laughs> What you used to call it a genie. I think that's what we used to call it. Something like that. Light one. Whoosh, it all goes off. But revival is like that. They started praying that small spark. And then the flame of God turned up. I don't know about you, but how or what were they praying? I was blown away. I don't know about you, Kai, but I was blown away on Friday night. 30 men were in the back room. And we're saying we want to dedicate ourselves to hear from God and see what he's got for us. I was actually quite emotional about it all because I'm thinking, if God rocks up now with 30 guys that are saying, I want to serve you and do what you want to do, your, your kingdom come and your will be done, we're seeking your purpose and agenda, I just got all goosebumps thinking, what's God going to do? What is God going to do? Now, what were they praying? Well, I know, I'm sure a number of us will know um, what Jesus is saying in John 14, 13. Um, let me put this up for you. Good Bible verse this. I'm sure when you've we've heard about prayer, this is something you've gone to. Verse 13 says, And I will do whatever you ask in my name. This is Jesus speaking. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Come on, that's how we pray, isn't it? Who's going to shout out, that's not what it says, Darren? I can see at least one person shaking their head there. That's not what the Bible says. I missed a bit out, and most people do. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. You see, it's really difficult. Let me drop back, you see. We miss that little bit out. This is how we pray. This is where the devil comes in, and that little word twisted. He takes things and drops little bits out. It's not about me asking Jesus for everything, and at the end of my prayer, I say in Jesus' name. I do still say in Jesus' name, because that is the name that I enter in through. But what is the purpose of this? If I'm going back to what is finding out what God's agenda is, and not my selfish agenda, my not, not my holy uh, vending machine, then I need to remember that in everything that I'm doing, and everything that I'm seeking God for, it's so that the father may be glorified in the son it's not all about me myself and I and what I need just a few verses or few words missed out and it transforms everything 
I was also intrigued with Jesus' prayer at Gethsemane, Matthew 26, uh, 36 through to 39. It says this, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. I don't know about you, but that's quite helpful. And I can see Jesus can be sorrowful and troubled. Kind of helps me sometimes. Then he said to them, Jesus speaking again, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed and said, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. I don't know how you, what you caught in that. Did you catch that little bit in there about how Jesus prayed? What prayer really looks like? Because that's a righteous prayer that we just saw there. Do we pray like that? Now, what are you saying, Darren? Well, because if we're going to pray in the name of Jesus, if we're going to be disciples of Jesus, if we're going to be followers of him, then that is what the job description looks like. Being to that place where we're in utter obedience to what God might say. Not some wishy-washy movement that says, if I pray the right things, everything's fine and happy, rich and health and all of that stuff, all the health and wealth stuff. This is a tough call to follow God into whatever he might call us to do. So we need to be listening to him. I don't know how I would react if God had given me that kind of call on my life. Sorrowful? I don't know. Would you let this cup, take this cup from me? It's a hard thing to follow Jesus. But he is our commanding officer. And we're called into a heavenly battle against an enemy and a number of people I spoke about this week who likes to distract and destroy. It was part of the message last week. Who's been distracted this week? Who's going to do something and you got distracted? It happens all the time. And I don't know about you, but I actually called it out this week. I went, no, I'm not being distracted. Oh, we'll just do that bit. The amount of time still this week, I mean, pray for me. I open my phone up to answer an email and it's like, oh, someone sent me that. Or something on family chat. And I put the phone down. I go, no, I went to go and do something and I haven't answered that email. Anybody else with me on that? Good. You know, I mean, is that, is that a work of the enemy or is it just that we're on self-destruct ourselves anyway? I don't know. But the enemy does want to distract and destroy us at every opportunity, whether that's with relationship issues, whether addictions that come along and, and challenge us, whether it's things printed in the newspaper or malicious tongues that might wag. Instead, God wants us to be a people that breaks those yokes of oppression. This is something we said about on the men's weekend away. What has God called us to do? To feed the hungry, to set the captives free. And you might be sat there saying, it's great, Darren, but it's really hard, all this stuff, because I'm a broken person too. I might put my Sunday face on this morning, but actually I struggle too. So if you are saying that this morning, let me encourage you greatly. Because this is how the Bible operates, doesn't it? If you've got your Bibles handy, you can look in 1 John 1, 8 to 9. I think this is very helpful, but I'll put it on the screen because I want to encourage you with this. 1 John 1, 8 to 9. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all righteousness. You know, the challenge I would say, if you think you've got it all all right and you're doing really well this morning and everything's hunky-dory, I think the trouble is, if we say there's no sin in my life, we're defeat, deceiving ourselves. I would encourage you that if life is hard and a challenge and you find that the enemy is constantly having a go at you, you're doing something right. I would even say that with what's happened in the local press this week. I was sure that there might be a kickback from some of the things I've been praying for for folk and here we go, we see things that come back. When we start facing oppression, 
If you are facing difficult things on behalf of Jesus and you get kickbacks, it's because you're in the right place and you're doing the right thing. So be encouraged. That's our focus. Our focus is to hear from God. So what is our practice then? What is our practice? Well, part of that, as we look back here and getting back to the sort of basics, we need to communicate with God. And what does prayer look like? It's great that we've had the Lord's Prayer a couple of times this morning. But um, is there any, uh, any bakers amongst us here? Any bakers and cooks and stuff? Because we're told to pray with a teaspoon. There's a teaspoon, very good looking teaspoon. What's the, what's the abbreviation for a teaspoon if you're baking or cooking? TSP. Yeah, are we agreed? Do you do baking as well? Come to your house for one of your cakes if you do baking. I bet they're really good. TSP, how do we pray with a teaspoon? Does anybody know how to pray with a teaspoon? Good, there's a few people. You know how to pray with a teaspoon. Can you remember what they are then? What T stands for? Thankful. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Sorry and please. Honestly, these guys are on it this morning. The best way to pray is we pray those thank you prayers. We say to God, you are amazing and you are awesome. We thank God for all he is and that all he's done. That's the how we enter into God. That is bringing our worship to God. You are worthy of my worship. I thank you for all that you are and all that you have done. And then we move to that place of saying, sorry. It's the confession part. God, I am sorry. I have done these things wrong. Yet again, God, here I am. You know me well by now. It's only at the next place that we move on to our please prayers but you know what happens I think when we've done the thank you stuff and we've done the sorry stuff our please sometimes takes on a very different picture sometimes we find God has moved in a very different way who else has praised with a teaspoon anybody else heard of that before now you know how to pray pray with a teaspoon from our reading this morning, Matthew 6, Jesus taught us how to pray. We've mentioned that a minute ago. But actually, it's a, it's a really interesting challenge. You brought it out. How many people still know the Lord's Prayer? You know, it's not on, probably on the, on the school walls anymore. It's certainly not something I, I'm trying to think back to when I learned it. It must have been in school assembly. It must have been in school assembly. But that's not done every morning, is it, to teach the Lord's Prayer anymore? I certainly know you'll get all the American stuff that comes through on the news and they say you've taken the Ten Commandments off the walls, you've taken the Lord's Prayer down and look what's happening out in America at the moment. But actually the Lord's Prayer contains all of those elements of thankfulness, confession and provision. And actually in context, echoing verse 12, if you were to look in Matthew 6 and verse 14, it comes with a promise. Jesus says, I have actually got this I think. Up on the screen for you. There we go. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is Jesus teaching us how to pray. Because forgiveness is a very powerful weapon. And we can choose to use it or not. I mentioned spiritual toolkits earlier. Who would say forgiveness is in their spiritual toolkit? Yeah, you know Nikki has because she put it up on the screen and I've nicked her slide. Forgiveness in your spiritual toolkit. I don't know about you, but I find it very interesting whenever you in that place or that time when someone comes to faith or they confess lots of things before God and they experience God's forgiveness, almost every time folks say, I need to go and forgive somebody else. I need to let them know. That power of forgiveness that we experience when, God, when, when we experience that from God, we then go and say, I need to forgive others. I wish we could bottle that kind of energy. But in reality, it's through prayer 
that we have that ongoing energetic relationship with God. I'll quote to you from Tozer here. I've got part of it on the screen. You might have heard this before. It's from um, Man, the Dwelling Place of God. And he's speaking about most evangelical churches. And he says this, it is scarcely possible in most places to get anyone to attend a meeting where the only attraction is God. He's talking about prayer meetings here, guys. He carries on, he said, one can only conclude that God's professed children are bored with him, for they must be wooed with meeting him with whatever it is. You fill in the blank. Are you bored with God, or can you not wait for the next prayer meeting? As a few people, they're going, preach it, Darren. (laughs) But, you know, where do we get excited about the prayer meeting? Where do we see those things? Because I don't know about you, is it just a stuffy thing where, where we get together and, and like nothing happens? You know, where we've seen God really moving. When we prayed as men on the weekend away, I, God turned up in quite a powerful way. And I was wholly expectant on Friday night that something amazing is going to come from 30 blokes, and there were still more that couldn't make it, a gathering together, say, we dedicate ourselves to you, God. What are you going to do? Well, what about Church. I don't know how many of us are here this morning. There's a good number. If we dedicate ourselves to God and say, come, are you expecting God to do something or not? When we see the revivals break out, sometimes it's only with a small amount of people. But how are you finding things this morning? Are you on fire for God? Are you in that place of saying, come on, can't wait for the next prayer meeting? Or are you in that place of saying, to be honest, Darren, I am just a little bit lost Let's be clear, God hasn't changed. That God that we see that's powerful, that's doing stuff, he hasn't changed. You know, same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still that exciting, faith-stretching, walking on the water God that he's always been. And when we stepped out that first time and we just thought, I don't know about you, but when I got saved, I'm like, God, I want to save the world with you now. Let's go and just tell everybody about Jesus. Heaven was so tangible for me in that moment. And I know we can have that daily still. Do you want that joy and peace and love of God? How are you connecting with him? How are you connecting with God? It may be that you are feeling lost and you're saying, well, once I had this stuff, and maybe you just sat there this morning saying, do you know what? You're just reminding me of all of that place that I once was and I'm just not there anymore. Do you want it? Do you want it? I'm going to move on to fasting. Fasting because sometimes... Fasting and the power of God is something we need. I don't know if it's a bit, bit holistic that way. I don't know if it's a bit new age. It's the best I could find. He actually had a belly button on the picture. I've got rid of the belly button. I thought that was far too much. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> but following on from our Lord's Prayer reading this morning, Jesus continues then, what does he say to speak about fasting? Now, if you look in your Bibles, if you haven't done this before, you've got your Matthew 6 open and you look, Matthew 6, 16, grab your Bibles and have a quick look because you might have gone, yeah, I know the Lord's Prayer was there or maybe go, I remembered it's there. But look at Matthew 6, 16. If you've got your Bibles, grab them out and have a quick look. What does it say? What does it say? Is Jesus speaking... Talking about fasting, does he say, if you fast? What does it say? You shout it out again. When? When. Jesus just teaches us how to pray. And then he doesn't say, if you want to think about fasting, he actually says, when you fast, implying that it's something that you do. Now, I was back at our last church. I've been there a few years. We were talking about some stuff. We were going out to do a a, a mission out in the community. And I said, let's put a month of prayer and fasting. And I know you guys have done some of that. This church had never heard of fasting. I had folk there that had been Christians for 50 years and had never fasted. They'd never been in that place. Now, for the Christian, and if you look back at hallmarks, some of the things that we looked at before, a hallmark of a Christian is fasting. 
Now, it's a massive topic, and the young people are doing amazing this morning. I like their picture, actually, that they're doing over there. It looks awesome. I'm going to be very brief on this last point, but I briefly want to lay some stepping stones that we'll come back to at another time. So, a good place to start is, what is fasting? Yeah? Jesus teaches us, just seen it in Matthew, that fasting and prayer are interlinked. And I believe fasting is something that can unlock an answer from God. I have had conversations this week saying we have fasted and nothing's happened. So it's not the magic key, it's not the magic thing, but actually it's something we read about in the Bible. And I think part of fasting is why do we fast? When we recognise that the only way we're going to hear from God is to say I'm sustained by you and your word alone or my relationship with you alone, not with food. It's all about God showing up and he is all I need to make it through this situation. I don't know how many people have done long fasts. Um, Jesus obviously fasted for a very long time. Some people do a, a fast where they miss dinner and go for the next day. Some do the full day thing, three or four day, five day fasting. Has anybody done more than five days? Anybody done more than three days? Three days, well done. You know, when we seek God out, three day fasts, very interesting. It's about God showing up. And let's just be clear what a fast is, because both Hebrew and Greek translate it to this. It's the voluntary absence of food, okay? The Hebrew translation literally says not to eat, and the Greek actually means no food food okay that's what a fast is Jesus showed us what fasting looked like so we can go to the Bible and see that it's not about giving up chocolate I'm afraid you can give up chocolate if you like but that ain't fasting it might be a small part of it giving up social media for Lent it ain't fasting it might be something good to do in fact we should probably all give up social media for a little while anyway uh, but that's not fasting and, and that's not the purpose of a fast if you want to do what the Bible says and not something what looks like what the Bible says guess what we've got to do what the Bible says and that's not consuming food now let me just give you a little bit of context on this because right back in creation in Genesis 2:17. Adam and Eve, we spoke about this last week and the fall. There's so much stuff we can get out of this. What did God say about the knowledge, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? He said, you must not eat from it. He didn't say you can't touch it. He didn't say you can't look at it. He didn't say you can't wear it. He says you must not eat it. Why? Well, the point I'm making with the fast here, there's something significant that happens when we put food inside of us. That's why we are where we are today. That's why sin entered the world, because somebody ate something. They consumed it. They put that in their body. And I believe scripture and history shows us that there's a special breakthrough when we fast. Again, this is part of some of our Men's Weekend Away stuff. Uh, we read from Isaiah 58. It says, is this not the kind of fasting I've chosen to loose the chains of injustice? and untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke. We unpacked that a little bit more and I'm just bringing this into land now. Fasting, it adds something to our prayer. There is a certain power that can be, not necessarily is, can be released. And actually if you've never fasted, you've never prayed and fasted about something, I think you're missing out on something. It's one of those key things. We see it in the scriptures. It's, a, it's something maybe should be in your spiritual toolkits. And let's be honest, if the Bible teaches it, I don't know about you, I want to do those things. Why wouldn't we want to do that? Now, I pretty much guarantee everybody in the room has got some kind of special breakthrough that you're asking from God. I don't necessarily like that phrase, but I think it's kind of, we need to get through that thing, or that thing is weighing me down. Whatever it is, sometimes I'm praying for this, and we need a bit of a breakthrough. In Mark 9, 29, uh, there is uh, the boy with the impure spirit, and the disciples were trying to heal him, and they couldn't, and Jesus did. Why? What did Jesus say? So he said to them, this kind, talk about the spirit, can come out by nothing 
but prayer and fasting. This is Jesus' teaching. So if you go back to him and say, Jesus, teach us how to pray. He taught us how to pray. We have his prayer. But this is where special authority came. So what's the takeaway? This series is just a whistle-stop tour of a number of things that hopefully help us move into that place of maturity in Christ. And a lot of these subjects that we probably go over here, we'll, we'll dig into these a bit deeper in midweek studies as we come up, because this is a huge topic prayer this morning but I want us to continue to grow in maturity in Christ and if prayer isn't something that gets you excited if prayer is one of those things you think oh no it's the prayer meeting it's going to be so dull you know go and read about some revival stuff and find out what happened when God's people got together were sincere and when they prayed and also with fasting, I know you've done some of this as church, but there are a number of things. Folk have got some very real things going on in their lives. I've had some conversations this week, said, should we as church be praying and fasting over those things? And if you've never done that before, it would be really good, not just that we've got our prayer journal, but we've got our prayer and fasting journal, our list. Who are we praying for? Where are we fasting? Where are we standing with one another and encouraging these things? It's a massive weapon in our spiritual toolkits and we can fast anytime, any place, anywhere. But we need to be right with God. And this is where I'm going to land this this morning. If we're not in that right place with God, remember he's not the, he's not the, the old bloke on a cloud with a big stick beating us. God is gentle with us. Holy Spirit is gentle and he keeps nudging us. And you and I know when God is nudging us. And this is the takeaway this morning. This is the takeaway. This Bible verse. Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now, of course, there's two sides to that kind. One side, we're instructed to uh, confess our sins and receive healing from God. But on the flip side, you know, if we want to live like Jesus, we've got to get away from those selfish ways. Those wicked ways is what we boiled it down to earlier. This is what makes us a righteous person when we live as Jesus lived. A prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Do you want that? Nikki always laughs when I say, do you want that now? But it is urgent, isn't it? Do you want that? Do you want that now? To be in that place of righteousness that we might grow in maturity in Christ. I'm going to invite the band to come up. We're going to sing a couple of closing songs together. And I just encourage you that as we, as we draw the service to a close today, look at your prayer life. Look at those places where you are with God. Where are you connecting? We've even tried at church now. You don't have to install Zoom anymore if you want to come to the prayer meetings. You literally go to emmanuelbaptist.co.uk forward slash prayer. It's that simple. And it's like a little knock button. You click the knock button and someone will let you into the prayer meeting. And you can join us online if you can't get in. But there are other times that we should gather and pray. So let's pray together as we uh, move towards singing our last few songs together. Father God, I just really pray this morning that you would indeed help us to move to that place of obedience again. That Father, as we wait to hear from you, Lord, we would grow in confidence. We would grow in resilience. And Father, not only would we grow, but we would seek, we would, we would, we would um, hear from you and, and find out what it is that you want to do in and through not just this church, but each of us individually. That Lord, we would find, that's the word I was looking for, your agenda, Lord. What is it that you are doing? Let us not just invite you in to come and bless the stuff that we do, which is a bit pants sometimes anyway. Father God, that we'd invite you into those places to say, grab hold of me and point me in the right direction. Because as you taught us how to pray, I want to see your kingdom come and your will be done. 
And Lord, as we step into that, may you grow our confidence. May you build your kingdom, we pray. In Jesus' name, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen.